Hello everyone, I'm Diane Andone. I'm coming from the Politecnica University of Timisoara in Romania. I am the director of the e-learning center, but in the same time, I'm Eden Vice President for Communication and Communities. And welcome to, I think it's the 11th of 12th webinar of Eden, part of the European Online Distance Learning Week, which Eden organized now for the fourth time. I'm so happy that this time we are going to speak about open education technologies for online education. And if you will allow, I will start with uh, the first introduction, tiny bit of introduction to this, uh, to what open education is and how and what it means into this uh, webinar. I hope you are all seeing it right. Okay, thank you. And uh, this means that uh, I'm ready to go. So this webinar is going to be um, hosted by me, but I'm going to have some four really amazing and really courageous and uh, visioners of uh, what open education and open source means and how open education tools are really, or really have already transformed the open education. Uh, briefly, something about the last things which we are doing and uh, in, in terms of my team, we are looking now at the things of blockchain into education because we moved somehow all of this process from digital education and digitalization and digital transformation. And we are now looking and already we established and done some tests on how to establish a, a diploma, a certificate and a learning passport for using blockchain education for the um, for the students. And this is something which the other presenter will not touch. So this is why I wanted to mention it very briefly. Here are some examples from the European uh, Distance and E-Learning Network, the EDEN Network, some projects in which EDEN was involved uh, recently. And this is the whole belief on what I think the digital education can mean and where we should have been now in the middle of the digital transformation, but uh, not everywhere is happening the same. Uh, we are also speaking quite a lot when we speak about open education tools and technologies uh, to open source, to software which is based on open source or was designed by using open source principles and technologies. And for this, we will have a special guest today who is going to speak about the European Union new policy and new strategies into open uh, source. And uh, here I'm putting also something which probably he will not show, the open source observatory where everybody can be part. And I encourage you to join the European open source observatory. The other bit which is quite new was launched officially in uh, September, 2020 is the European Union Digital Education Action Plan. The plan which is envisioned for 2021 to 2027 where one of the things which is inputted into this action plan is the idea of developing a European digital education content framework, also based on, on tools, but also on content that can build on a European culture and creativity diversity and launch also something about a European exchange platform on, uh, on terms of uh, tools, open educational resources, and so on, and to be also certified courses, or also blockchain technology. So quite a lot of the things which we are going to discuss today are somehow leading towards uh, this action which European Union and the European Commission have recently launched, and we are strongly believing that's the future. Here you have uh, the link and also the website where you can find the action plan. And this is uh, in the same policy of the open educational technologies. I apologize if you see, hear my dog barking. Um, uh, so this is somehow leading towards the open educational technologies, which is in uh, an initiative which uh, was launched in 2019 in Barcelona. And I'm pretty sure one of our speakers today will speak about uh, this. And now I'm ready to stop the share and to try to give uh, the, the floor to our first speaker, not uh, before I'm uh, mentioning and kindly asking you to put your questions in the Q&A uh, section, which you find 
down under your screen in Zoom. Those which are watching us on YouTube, please put your questions into the comment area and we will take them from there. And in the chat area, you can present yourself and say from where you're coming and who you are and things like that. So just to let you know us uh, who is coming and from where. And please be aware that in the um, chat area, you have two options to send the chat only to panelists and to panelists and attendees. So without uh, no further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce one of my close and somehow even old friend. We share almost the same age. So we are always uh, very keen on this. We started many, many years ago with uh, believing strongly that the future of open education cannot be built if you don't have tools and technology to support that. And uh, Moodle have done this tremendously for the open education sector, not only higher education, but also for the post-secondary uh, schools. So Martin Dojiamas, the CEO and founder of Moodle, coming live from Australia. Martin, please. Thank you, uh, Diana. Uh, I think I'm unmuted. Yeah. Good. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the intro and uh, thanks everyone for coming. I think you've been having, some of you have been to quite a few of these this week. Um, but thanks for coming to this one. I'm looking forward to the discussion and actually the other speakers as well. So I've got a bit of time uh, to talk about what's been happening in my world and I'll get straight to it. Uh, yeah. So, um, yes, my, my main role uh, and my, most of my time is spent uh, with Moodle, of course, uh, for the last nearly, nearly 20 years. Um, working on Moodle. And uh, that's really taken up more of, of the time this year than I wanted to. But my other two things that I do is uh, open ed tech, as, um, as was just mentioned by Diana. Um, and I'm also a board director on Open Education Global, which is a, a, a global, uh, about 300 or so institutions uh, are members, and we look at open education in general. So I don't need to talk about uh, COVID, you're aware, but at its peak, um, we had this situation of 91% of the world's learners um, having to suddenly go online. And there's been um, a terrific amount, a wave of activity coming off that for, for those of us working in this field. Um, now it's down, it's not as much, it's around 33%, but still I feel, you know, even with coronavirus going up in many places, uh, it's very topical and there's still huge uh, waves and chaos happening uh, in the education field. Um, we joined the UNESCO's global coalition very early and we've been involved in some of the most, some of the largest and most interesting projects this year uh, that we've seen ever. Uh, these are whole countries, um, looking for solutions, sending teachers uh, to places. Even a few weeks ago, we suddenly had 30,000 teachers open Moodle Cloud sites, for example, because somebody mentioned, oh, yes, you can get a Moodle Cloud site in the Dominican Republic. And the whole country just came over to us. So, you know, we have all these uh, big things that are happening. And, and that's in a context, and education is always in a context of uh, – you know, what is it we're trying to teach and, and what is the world that we're educating people for? And this year is, you know, we have fake news and, and, and deregulations happening. Um, we have recessions and uh, or threatened recessions. We have share markets up and down. Um, just as an example of that as well, probably last year, I may, maybe I was getting one email every week or two from some venture capitalist who wants to buy Moodle. Uh, in the past six months, I've been getting uh, maybe one or two a day. And it's because this, oh, their shares aren't doing well in other industries. Let's look at what's doing well, education. And, you know, so that you can imagine the activity and the, the, the chaos there. Um, the education crisis I just mentioned, we have a political upheaval. I'm sure a lot of you have wasted far too much time worrying about what's happening in the US right now. Uh, 
let's not forget we have a climate crisis, which is is very real, very dangerous, um, only getting worse, especially this year. We've even gone backwards in some degree because we've we've gone back to more plastics and and less care and um, all kinds of issues there. And and human rights is still a massive problem, uh, even in the most developed countries. So these are some of the contexts of what's happening this year. So what have we been doing? What have we been doing? Well, let me tell you, I was asked to tell you a little bit of news about what we've been working on, and I'll just give you some updates. So if you're using Moodle, you might like to know Moodle 4.0 is coming out next year. We're working very, very hard on it, and very particularly, this is all about user experience. Uh, the way it works, the number of clicks it takes, how you create things, how you interact as a student, as a teacher, or as an admin. And we have a number of projects um, happening right now, and the team are super, super hard working on these things now, even though it's a year away, because the changes we're making are so significant, and we have to plan out everyone's way through that. Uh, we also have a, a very small, uh, small release, 3.10, uh, coming out on Monday. Um, so that's got actually, it says small fixes, but actually more things went into it than we expected. They're mostly from the community, so some good things. Um, we have a lot of plugins. We have actually coming up for around 2,000 plugins uh, soon um, because it's growing quite quickly that of the community have built on top of Moodle. And we have a problem with our Moodle plugins and that the administrator needs to be needs to put them into the Moodle site. A teacher can't do it. So we are building a new subscription service called the Moodle plugin service for next year that will allow even a teacher to add a new plugin to their course without installing any code. Uh, and that's all those plugins that we have in our database will be like a, a Netflix of options or a, a Spotify of options or a YouTube of options uh, that you can bring into your course. Uh, and our MoodleNet project continues. We had a bit of a hiccup this year when uh, we lost most of the team in around June. Um, we learned a lesson about uh, rogue development, I think, in that in that process. Uh, our MoodleNet team was basically left to themselves uh, to work on this. And uh, when it came close to release, uh, we found out the quality was not what we wanted. Despite that, the current software is currently open. You can go and try it right now on Moodle.net. Um, and what this is, is a, it's, what it's meant to be is a social network around content. So the point is that uh, educators curate the best content for their subject together into groups and subjects. And now that it's been open for a while and people are using it, it's become very clear that this first design, the, the user experience is not at all what we want. Uh, and also the technology is not what we want. So for the past two months, we've been working on a, a reboot of this. We've got new technology. We've got new UX. Uh, I can't show you that yet. This is still the old interface. But it will be coming much, much sooner than the first version because we've learned a lot. So we're hoping in the next uh, few months we'll have it out again and, and you'll, it'll be launched. And the big thing about this is we're trying to build it not as a central service, but as servers that are distributed around the world and federated together into a, into a single system that, that works. Uh, another thing that's been going very well is our Moodle Educator Certification Program. And we have hundreds of people getting certified. Uh, they're following the 22 competency framework uh, from Europe, the Digcomp Edu. Uh, and this is not about Moodle. This is about all of the skills needed to be a good online teacher. And this was the best framework that we could find. And so we've implemented uh, a version of that um, with 22 courses. And it's a certification program. So it's not about teaching everyone how to do those things. It's about certifying. This has gone well, but we're going to take this to the ne next level. And let me explain. Um, oh, this is what the, a certificate looks like with some badges. So this year we we had to switch to global to our for our global Moodle Moot or our conference to be online, just like a lot of people. Uh, a lot of conferences have had to move online, and we had a conference that was uh, several days long um, and looked quite successful. Uh, there were um, 
I forget how many people were. Oh, yeah, 1,370. It's on the slide. And um, we had a, a very busy, you know, by all accounts, a, a successful conference. But it was very tiring because everyone had to be there for days, all day, every day for days, just like you do at a normal physical conference. So as a first evolution of a conference idea, it made sense. But for the future, where actually I'm looking at, we probably never have big conferences ever again physical conferences, it doesn't make sense. And so we're combining, uh, if you really think about what the conference is, it's an education scenario. Uh, this here, this is an education scenario. And um, the purpose of a conference is, is education. We're supposed to be good educators, right? So how do we build education into our lives as professionals? So we're, we're combining this certification and these events into a, a new thing that's coming out next year. It's called Moodle Academy. And there's a dot in the middle because that's actually an address. Now, you won't find a site there yet, um, but we are, we are working on our events team and our education team and some new people uh, to build an actual academy that focuses on the skills around online education. So there's, yes, there's the skills for an educator, for a teacher uh, that we just spoke about for the MEC, but there's also instructional design, there's uh, administration, there's developers, there's all kinds of roles that are needed to create successful online education. And instead of big events, basically it's just going to be an event that goes every day. And probably every week there'll be small events like two or three hours focused on a very specific topic. So you could imagine a two hour session just on student engagement, where there's maybe a similar format to this webinar actually with uh, some panelists and then um, a discussion. And that becomes part of the content that you learn uh, in a program towards achieving some certifications in a different area. So that's, that's the plan that we're working on now. Now, Back to the world, uh, what are we trying to do? We're trying to fix this. this. The SDGs are something I talk about a lot, but actually in our strategic planning for the future, we're building it into our DNA. So Moodle Net is going to be very much uh, framed around SDG solutions. Uh, and if I look at, if we look here at, uh, say, Number four, obviously, quality education is what we're all here for. And this is some of the sub goals under SDG4 um, that the UN have put together. Uh, there are lots of very interesting problems in here that we think Moodle and open education can solve in general. And uh, so a lot of our project and our thinking going forward is about this. And how much time have I got left, Diana? Tell me. Uh, hold up many fingers, two minutes, good. So uh, if we want to solve those problems, we have to counter these problems. These, these are the technology trends that are happening and we need to work with the trends. So yeah, we're gonna be more remote. I've talked, talked about that. There is a rise of artificial intelligence right now. I've been following AI for 30 years, but it's only in the last year that I feel it's really gotten scary. And it's going to take away human work. All kinds of jobs are going to disappear in the next years. Um, but we can use this power uh, in very good ways as well. And it's how we harness this in education that's the problem. Um, there's a battle between the formal education systems and the informal education systems. And there's an increase in fake news. And there's a big, big problem with the control of infrastructure. So we have a lot of big tech a lot of centralized technologies that are getting a lot of criticism for very good reason uh, versus the open way. And I really want to talk about now the open solutions here. So I see the future as being a collection of the tools, the open education technologies, which are mostly open source, all open source, um, the resources, the open education resources uh, that they, the entire world has actually voted to be the, the future through the OER recommendation last year and skills and the Open Recognition Alliance or in Open Badges uh, and other initiatives that I think Diana mentioned earlier. Um, these are pointing to a, a future solution for something that is so 
unsolved right now. Uh, I'm, I also run a company and I hire people and never once has anybody ever sent me a badge when they were applying for a job, like never. And badges are not just for jobs, badges for lots of reasons, but still you would think by now maybe somebody might have, but never because there's no common infrastructure at all and we need to, we need to find that. So with these three pieces, I believe we can empower a teacher and any educator to be like a guru sitting on a platform of technology, of resources, very easily accessible resources, and the ability to certify and recognize others and themselves and their skills. So the Open Ed Tech Festival that Diana mentioned um, is the core idea of this thing is that the, the technology part should be something you can own. And the ownership is the important thing here. When you own your infrastructure and don't just rent it, it opens up the right kind of thinking for the future that we need to solve real problems. As soon as you're only renting, um, you, you start becoming under the control of someone else. So we need people to own their own things. So there's a site with more about this on openedtech.global. Uh, as I said, not enough effort has been going into this in the last six months because of the pandemic, but it is still very much a big focus for me personally to keep driving. Um, and the thing we're, we're doing right now is to open, to create this Open EdTech Association. I'm finishing. Um, and the association is going to bring together, I'll skip through here, companies such as um, uh, these, uh, to work much, much closer together and to really build out that infrastructure, to build out that layer uh, of technology and make it very easy to access, to make sure it's sustained and always available. Um, and that'll help us all fight to keep education and technology open. Um, we can talk more in the questions if you have any. I'm very happy to take questions. So thank you very much. If you need to contact me, that's my email right there, martinetmoodle.com. All right. Thanks, Diana. I, you can tell I'm used to speaking for longer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Martin. Very much appreciated. I know this is the passion in you, you know, so it's really possible. It's making possible uh, for you to, to do this because you put so much passion into it. So I want to move to the next speaker and then we'll come back to Martin and to all of us. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Miguel Diaz Blanco, who is coming from the, um, uh, here you can see also him now, who is coming uh, from the European Commission, the DG Informatics, and he is the open source program office uh, leader, uh, which is a new office uh, established into the European Commission with the main purpose to promote and to encourage the very new launch, I think it's less than 10 days, the open uh, source strategy. He has about 20 years of experience in software development and for the last 11 years, he has been working for the European institutions. So Miguel, thank you very much for joining us and we are looking very much forward on what the open source software will, will support us in the European Union. Thank you. I thanks thanks Diana. Okay, let me let me share my screen quickly. Do you see it? Not yet, Miguel. Just a minute. Now it should come. Yes. And if you go in slideshow, it will be perfect. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Diana. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. It's the first time for me, so so thank you very much uh, for, for the invitation. Um, I'm gonna talk about three items. Obviously, as you said, Diana, it's very important for us to talk about the, the open source strategy, which indeed was released on the 21st of October, so very recently. Uh, I will talk also about other initiatives that we do in the area of open source. And finally, given the context, I will also talk about the Interoperability Academy, which is, I think for this event, it, it suits very well. Um, okay, starting uh, about the strategy of the European Commission. Um, 
it's not the first one that we have. It's something that we have been doing already since year 2000. But it was more in a local, on our local corner in, in, in Digit where I work, uh, Digit Informatics. And over the course of the years, we have had several iterations of the strategy uh, to get finally to this last version that we just recently announced. And um, it's a different one because the previous ones, as I said, it was in our corner. It was uh, an internal working document. But this one is really the, the whole commission in all the areas where we work uh, to change our, our attitude, our our. Uh, practices and to orient it more into uh, an open source way. Uh, and we really uh, like this motto, think open, because this is what we want to change now. So it's what we call a communication to the commission is really the whole college of commissioners asking us as a whole commission to, to, to change and to embrace more open source practices and, 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 uh, and yeah, and, and ideas. Um, the, this strategy comes with an action plan and it has uh, 10 actions. I'm not gonna go through all of them. I will explain uh, a few a few ones. And uh, the first one, as uh, Diana, you mentioned, is the creation of an OSPO, an open source program office, where I yeah I, I belong to with, with my colleagues. And we will be the entity responsible for making sure that the other actions from the other 10, uh, get accomplished given the, the in the in the set uh, deadlines, and uh, just to explain a few of them. The, the, the first one is what we call inner source uh, as default or, or breaking silos. Um, you you have to know that commission is very big. Uh, we are around maybe 40, 40, 45,000 people working there, if you include officials and consultants. And we have many people producing software, many teams, and sometimes we do not share the things that we do. We produce code, but other people are not aware. So as part of our action plan, we are gonna change things so that for new projects, when we develop code, by default is going to be open to our teams in our Git repository. So we are already trying to have a change of culture and try to have the solutions that we have reusable by, by other teams. So that will be uh, an, an interesting action. Uh, and going one step further, a second action will be to change the rules that we currently have when we want to have our uh, code make public, for instance, in GitHub. Uh, currently, for instance, I mentioned Leos is one of the projects that we have in commission where we have our code in, in GitHub. Uh, to do that today, it's very difficult. It's well. It's not difficult, but it takes a lot of time. You have to follow some uh, administrative procedures. You have to uh, create a commission decision. So it's very heavy, and we want also to change that. So for the next projects, when someone produces a new code, new application, by default, the option to go outside and to have that code available to the external world, uh, it's directly possible without having to go into heavy administrative procedures. So this is the second action that we are working on. Uh, and as you see, it's about changing the culture of the whole institution. Um, uh, a third action I would like to talk is the innovation labs, uh, open source innovation labs. It's about creating a protected safe environment where we test tools in all areas. Uh, that we believe might have uh, uh, a purpose or, or might fit into a use case for commission or EU citizens. So we are going to get in touch with internal teams, but also with external communities and uh, also in the area of academics uh, to see in which cases we can adopt open source tools um, if, if we find there is, a, there is a valid case for it. So this is something the OSPO will be in charge of making sure it happens as well. And uh, the last action within this, this plan that I wanted to talk to, uh, it's about connecting more with communities. Uh, in the recent years, and maybe some of you know, there was a project called EU FOSA, which was about auditing open source software. Uh, we have been quite in close contact with the companies that, that you see there. And 
it would be nice also in the future to see the logo of Moodle and H5P as well. Uh, we are going to increase this outreach to open source communities, uh, have closer links, and see how we can do things, things together. Um, so, so far, I have given um, an overview of this action plan that, that we are responsible for. We are doing other things outside this strategy, um, which are interesting to mention, I believe, also. Uh, we are going to ask for a study to an external firm to help us to define possible funding mechanisms um, across for, for Europe, for open source European solutions. Uh, because sometimes you see that you have open source products used for plenty of solutions that are maintained maybe by a single person. So we will try to uh, have this study and see how can we create a funding mechanism to help that people behind those solutions that you, sometimes we don't know, but they are used massively by, by, other, by uh, other teams. Uh, another thing we are doing is to uh, benchmark ourselves, the commission, and more concretely, Digit, where I work, to see how well or how bad we are doing in terms of open source culture, uh, and practices when compared to other institutions in Europe, uh, private institutions, public institutions. This study is ongoing and we are eager to see the results to see where can we improve, where can we uh, go, go farther. And um, a third uh, activity that we are going to launch soon is a European inventory of open source products being used in public services. We want to know, as being a European institution, we want to know uh, what other institutions at regional level, national level across Europe, what open source tools are they using? And once we have this inventory to see how can we make more secure one of those, uh, one of the solutions that we, we detect. So, um, so those are additional actions that we are doing in addition to the ones I mentioned um, for this strategy. And, and given this context, uh, um, I think it was worth to talk also about the Interoperability Academy, which is uh, an initiative that is running under the ISA squared program. I don't know if you know about it. It's a program running for all, more than 10 years, if we consider the predecessors, uh, which is about promoting interoperability across Europe. So different countries, uh, yeah, working with reusable solutions, inter interoperable solutions, and um, it's it's something. It's a learning management system that has been developed by by Digit. Uh, it's based on open standards like SCORM. We use open source tools like Noodle, by the way, and it's, it was very interesting to see what Martin is is bringing over to the next in, in the next months and years. And uh, it's it's meant to help civil servants to learn more about interoperability. Uh, solutions uh, to, to, to close that gap in terms of digital skills, to use plenty of digital uh, interoperable and reusable solutions that we have across Europe. So it will be a system with a lot of courses in different ways, uh, live seminars, uh, e-learning, um, seasonal academies, and it will be a large catalog of products that will be available for different profiles, whether you are a developer or if you are a project manager or an architect. So it will be also adaptive to the, depending on, on the profile that you have. So this platform will be ready by Q1 2021. It's not live yet. But if you want to know more about it, you can go to join up. And I'm happy that Diana mentioned Ozor before because it's part of join up is the collaborative environment that we have at, at European Commission. Um, so you can see there more. I don't know if the slides will be shared, but uh, you have the link and you have also a functional mailbox that maybe is not visible, but I hope that you can see in, in the slides. So I hope that I gave you a, an interesting overview that what we are doing at, at Commission, as you can see, we are becoming more and more active. And, and given the context, I think it's even more important aspects like digital sovereignty and uh, openness, and uh, especially us, uh, Commission being a public institution, I think this motto that we like a lot, think open, is it should be in our in our hearts. So we are very excited, and uh, yeah, if you want to know more, um, you can see the strategy there. You have the link. 
And if you want to get in touch with the OSPO, there you have the our mail also. So uh, thank you very much. And I turn it over to you, Diana. Thank you so much, Miguel. This is really, really very, very interesting. And I quite liked so much that uh, logo, you know, with the European Union flag and the open source software symbol. Um, it's really surprising. I need to say I never seen it until now. So that was also new for me. And I quite like the idea that you are moving even more with the interoperability academy and you are opening it uh, more towards other people, not only those which are inside the, the European Commission or around the European Commission. So we are moving now and I'll take questions and debate a tiny bit later. I'm trying to get everybody say their point and what they are doing towards the open source or open education technologies. And uh, next is coming a technology which I love a lot. It's quite new on the market and it's going to be presented by Jwain Tore Griffith, who is uh, the founder of H5P from Norway, but he's also the managing director of Jubal. He is uh, known also as Falcon. This is how I known him first time. I learned his real name much later, to be honest. And that's something which I always enjoy, the, uh, enjoy saying. I'm sorry for making it public, but this is live, right talk. We are in open here, so we say quite a lot of other things. He's very, very uh, good on thinking about open education resources and open education tools. And he strongly believes all the time or all the time and his professional life was towards this. He already led uh, three open source authoring tools projects, which are very successful and used by hundreds and thousands of people. So Jvaintov, the floor is yours and H5P, please. Thank you. Thank you, Diana, for the introduction and uh, thank you for having me here. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to speaking with you guys. I'm not going to go through any slides today. I'm going to show you uh, our latest development. Many of you might have heard about it already. We've been working really hard this year uh, on our OER hub, uh, which is, is built into H5P. It is delayed. We, we would hope, we're hoping to have it done this summer in the northern part of the world. So a couple of months ago, but it is coming now. Uh, it's possible to demo it, as you will see. And uh, it's not far from being released. We are currently porting it to Moodle and to hpp.com. It's already ready for Drupal. And uh, I hope, uh, hope uh, we'll have it at least by Christmas. So let me share my screen and I'll show you the HPP hub. So hopefully, uh, if you could nod, if you can see my screen, Diana, I guess you, you're seeing uh, H4P there, yeah. So the idea with H4P and what you're seeing now is, is uh, where we started. We wanted to enable people to make better content faster. There are plenty of open source projects that are content related. You have, uh, yeah, you have Moodle from, from Martin. Uh, content is a big part of it, but it's, it's not their only focus. You have Drupal, you have WordPress, you have lots of things that, that have content in them, but it's not the, it's not the sole focus of, of the project. H4P, uh, for us, content is the only thing. So uh, enable people to build the best content possible as fast as possible and, and try to achieve that through reuse. Um, what we're looking at now is, is what we have out there already. So you can pick between various templates and fill them in and you don't have to think about uh, coding or design or anything like that. It just just works. Um, and the next step and kind of the heart and soul of, of our vision is the content hub. So you shouldn't have to do the content from scratch either. There are thousands of resources out there on Pythagoras or democracy or uh, car mechanics or, or whatever. And, and uh, there's no reason we should build them from scratch all the time, especially not when there are probably thousands in the H4P format already. Uh, so what we built is this new button here, get shared content. So the H4P hub, it's not a website. It's a built-in part of the H4P authoring tool. So it will be distributed as a software update. 
and and most H4P users will will just get it and and they get this new button and they can search our hub. Uh, we think the hub will be pretty. It won't be empty when we launch it. There are universities around the world who have promised uh, thousands of H4Ps to be added to the hub when it goes live. Uh, there are UN projects. Uh, one promised over 5,000 interactive books that they will share through the H4P hub when it's coming. So when you go in here, hopefully fairly quickly after launch, there will be lots of content and you'll be able to search through it, filtering by disciplines. Uh, by types of content, so you can uh, filter on games, multimedia, or you can go further down and you can filter on just flashcards, virtual tours, etc. Depending on what you're looking for, filter on license, language, level, and we are also reviewing so that uh, by default you only see serious contributions. Uh, we don't have math experts and physics experts and all that, so it might be errors in it, but if you have the reviewed content, it will be serious contributions. It won't be test content, etc. And when you find content you like, you can, of course, also search. And the search searches through everything, the content itself, the metadata, all of it. Uh, and then you can click on your search results. You can look at the content, look at images, and you can see I just have to get rid of some Zoom stuff. And then you can see uh, if this is what you're looking for. It's also possible to click the preview button and have a preview of the content before you go for, for, for this content. And if this is the content you want, the way it works is that you click Get Content. And what happens now is that we have a central repository of OER content. I'm downloading a copy of of the course presentation from that central repository to my server first, and then it, it loads into my browser. And when I have Zoom running, it's extra slow, but uh, yeah, we, we've got it now. So it, it's usually fairly quick. We have done a lot to make it super fast, the search and everything should be really, really fast. And now I have my own copy of this uh, content, and I can, of course, uh, go in and edit move around stuff and when i'm happy with it i can click save and i can publish it to my students uh, with my edits so uh, let's say I, I wanted to make a cloudberry resource uh, and instead of creating from scratch i tried to just type in cloudberries first and actually there were this nice resource there already and i saved a lot of time and now i can even make it better so i can actually make resources better much much faster there are lots of other OER projects out there. Um, our advantage with, with H5P, the reason we think it will be a lot more successful is that we already have hundreds of thousands of websites and organizations using H5P, uh, millions of authors, and this is built into the authoring tool. So it is super portable. It's super easy for people to adapt it and, and use it the way they want to. And we don't need to market it. It's just launched as a software update. So. So it, it, it is, um, yeah, we, we really think we can achieve what we have been working for since we started to, to let people, let the be, default be reuse instead of having the default of creating content be created from scratch. I'll also show you quickly how to share content. Very good, because that's what I was going to ask you. Yeah, <laughs> let's look at the sharing. So I'm, I'm not gonna create from scratch. Uh, I guess most people here have used H4P already. So I'm just gonna upload an H4P file, which is another way you can reuse them. Uploading the file <clears throat> and then I save it. So now we have this content we want to share. Looks, looks nice. And we get this new button here in Moodle. It, will look slightly different, but there will be a button on top and the same on hvp.com, WordPress, etc. Be a little new share button. And then you are taken through a wizard to make sure that you have the correct metadata for sharing it. So you need a title. Uh, you might already have the license information in the package. We didn't now, so we 
I'm just picking a random license now. And these are the stuff that you have to add. And you also need a discipline. Uh, the disciplines you see now are temporary. It's not the real ones. We are using BB something for uh, a standard vocabulary for disciplines. And then you have all the required information. In addition, you can add some tags. So we can add orange. You can add any kind of keywords there. So you can make your own. Um, yeah, you can organize content your own way. And it will be interesting to see what kind of tagging the community starts using. Might be, yeah, might be lots of things. Let's not speculate. Uh, it is recommended to give it a short description. And a longer description for the page where you're looking at it. And we can upload an icon. So we can take, use a screenshot, for instance, as a nice icon to appear in the search results. And then we can have more screenshots for the detailed view of the content. And here you sh should uh, give it a good alternative text to make sure it's accessible. So screenshot of start screen for instance, and then we can have a screenshot of the end screen. Should have added more, but now, now I can go through and review all the metadata I have for this content. And if I'm happy with it, I press share. And we get a confirmation, so now it's, it's already on the H4P hub and ready for, for reuse by the rest of the world. So now millions of people can find this content and they can uh, reuse it. Things that are coming that is of great importance is that uh, oh, we're not canceling, sharing. If I, for instance, now create uh, not a dictation, but uh, let's say I wanted to create a course presentation. So currently the hub is in this main menu. You can use get shared content here, but we are also adding the hub here on top. So we'll be replacing this menu in, in the second version of the hub. And we are using the hub here as well. Obviously a special view of the hub that will allow you to drag in content types from the hub. And that also allow you to drag in content. So in the first version, you would be able to find the course presentation in the hub, but you wouldn't be able to find, for instance, a multiple choice question and put onto a slide. In the second version, it is also possible to, to use the hub within an H4P. So in an interactive video, you could drag in a fill in the blanks question from the hub or a drag and drop. In an interactive book, you could they use the hub to find uh, an entire interactive video, for instance, and use inside the interactive book. So that will also be very powerful. And another thing we do is if you share a big interactive book in the hub, we will both share the entire resource as one resource, and we will cut it apart so that all the different parts of it, if, if the interactive book has three interactive videos in it, uh, those three interactive videos will also be available separately in the hub. Uh, so it, it will be very powerful and, and work both on the main content level and on subcontent and be a very integrated part of, of H5P. So I hope uh, when we have it there, we'll see a lot of, uh, a lot of reuse. We'll see people share inspiring content that others can, can use to get ideas and learn how to build great things. And that will see uh, see us move a lot closer to our vision of of building better content faster. I don't know if I have more time, Diana. Uh, no, if you can just summarize, please. I really appreciate it. Okay, yeah, but then uh, I had a little uh, extra thing we've been working on that I could have shown you, but I'll uh, I'll keep it. I'll keep it secret. You can. <laughs> if, if, you, if you really want, you can quickly. 
because also this is really amazing and interesting. And uh, my first question to this will be, is it going to be a paid in service to H5P or is it going to be fully for free for educators? Yeah, no, it is fully for free and we don't have any plans of charging for it ever. So that's amazing. Thank you, Reinto. Really very good. Once MoodleNet will take off and with this, we are really going towards an open education system with resources available easily for everyone. So uh, thank you so much then. I'll stop the share. And uh, if we still have time towards the end, uh, we are going to, to, to be able to show you something more or something like that. But I want to give uh, the floor now to our next speaker because uh, in half an hour from now, mostly, not really, but very close to this, uh, we are going to open the Open Classroom Conference uh, here. <laughs> so that's why I need to keep an eye on the track and we need to finish in half an hour from now. So uh, it's my really great pleasure to introduce someone which uh, I haven't met uh, before. I just uh, recently met, but obviously I'm very, very much accustomed with uh, Red Hat. Uh, even when I was a student, in fact, to be honest, uh, starting from many, many years ago. And this is Sandra Moldoviano, who is uh, the program manager from Red Hat Academy, which is the powerful tool and support for the universities and students to learn about open source and how to empower themselves with open source, even features and knowledge and how to develop with open source. So Sandra, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Diana, and thank you again for the invitation and thank you all for being here. I'm happy to present you Red Hat Academy program. Um, I will try not to share the screen. Okay. Please let me know if you can see my presentation. Now present mode. <laughs> okay, so, yes, and yeah. please open right. your camera. I, uh, we lost oh, your camera. It, it's, it was on. Yeah. Uh, you, you switched off your camera. Yes, now it's perfect. Okay. And now, so you can see the screen, yeah? Perfect. It's working okay. fine, Sandra. Hi, so my name is Sandra Moldovano, and I'm responsible for the Red Hat Academy program uh, in Europe and, and Russia. Um, I've been with Red Hat for over three years. Um, actually, for two years and a half, I had been focusing for um, on the whole Europe and Middle East Africa region, but as the region is huge, now I'm focusing on Europe and Russia. Um, so, what is Red Hat Academy program? Um, you know that we are facing now a huge uh, IT skills gap and companies are looking for people with the open source skills, Red Hat skills, our partners, our customers. And when I say customers, um, I mean also 90% of the Fortune 500 companies are um, Red Hat customers and they, they are having difficulties in finding um, people with Red Hat open, uh, and open source skills. Um, and so we have decided to create a um, nonprofit program um, Red Hat Academy program, which is um, our nonprofit program target targeted at educational institutions. So targeted at universities, high schools, colleges, um, to bridge this gap between education and industry. The membership is free of charge, so it's free for, for the members. And, um, and the content we offer, part of this program, covers Linux, uh, middleware, and cloud. Uh, and the content is the same one um, as we, the one we offer um, to uh, professionals, to companies. So we don't differentiate between professionals and, and students. However, where, um, while companies, professionals pay around 2,000, 3,000 euros for each course, um, instructors and students part of this Red Hat Academy program get these courses for free. Um, so Red Hat Academy has benefits uh, for all. Um, Red Hat is the open source uh, global leader. <laughs> and so this is the open source academic program. Uh, and we help institutions get, um, uh, get the up-to-date curriculum uh, um, in Linux Cloud and DevOps. We help instructors uh, stay current with curriculum updates and, uh, and prepare them to successfully teach uh, the courses to students. Um, students 
learning demand skills. Um, uh, they get the skills required in the job market. And after taking these courses, we help um, both instructors and students with discounted exams in order to get certified. Um, and after uh, after taking the courses, getting certified, uh, we want to connect them also with internal and external job opportunities. And now we are working also on a platform um, where our head academy students can upload their CVs and uh, we can help them. Um, we can connect them to our uh, ecosystem of partners, customers. Um, so, Red Hat Academy features um, free membership, all courses are hands-on, we have standardized materials, so the content is also the same we offer to commercial world, and we have the same content we offer also in other countries, in other region um, uh, in the world. Uh, we support the instructors um, with, with instructor guides, with video classrooms, to make sure that they are, they are prepared to teach the courses, and we help them after that them and the students with the uh, um, discounted exams. Um, so our, our courses are online. Um, regarding the theoretical part, I've said the content is, um, um, is free. Um, the format might differ. So if the student um, just wants the online format, um, that he doesn't, he or she doesn't have to pay for anything. If um, a student wants an ebook or printed, then uh, this comes with a cost. Uh, however, the ebooks and printed books are optional, so the content is the same and can be accessed on our platform, on our Red Hat Academy portal. And there we have an administrator, an instructor, and a student view where all our courses are available and um, and the, all the materials are available. And instructors can also monitor the progress of the students. Um, and can also create assignments. We also have more languages available uh, in the program. Um, and as far as the, the lab part is concerned, um, we have the do-it-yourself lab option, uh, which is um, um, the free of charge option. So if the institution uh, decides to use um, its own infrastructure, we give, um, we give the credentials so that the institution can deploy um, and, and download the labs into their systems. Um, we also have a cloud option if students want to, um, to access the, the labs in cloud, they can per, uh, buy lab hours uh, from our partner um, NDG. We, we have a partnership with, with NDG Labs and they um, offer um, Linux, uh, so cloud labs for the Linux and OpenStack courses. And on the platform, um, if students want to take our containers courses, OpenShift or Introduction to OpenShift applications, we offer these cloud courses for free. So the cloud labs. The cloud labs are free on the platform. Um, how we how uh, do we support instructors? Um, so the university will choose the staff members to teach the courses, um, and we support these um, these lecturers, these instructors um, with the online courses uh, with video classrooms. Video classrooms are recorded courses by our um, top uh, instructors. Um, they have the labs, they have the theory, um, and each video classroom costs around 2,000, 3,000 euros, but all instructors part of the program um, get these video classrooms for free. And after attending this video classroom, they also get a certificate of attendance, uh, of course, completion. Um, and we also support instructors uh, with instructor guides. And after having taken these courses, um, if they want, uh, they can get certified and we support them with a 75% discount on the exams. However, it's not compulsory um, to be certified as an instructor in order to be able to teach the curriculum. But obviously, we highly encourage it because we think that instructors will be better prepared and it'd be also a pity not to take advantage of this uh, large discount. <laughs> um, we also support students um, with 50% um, with discount um, uh, on exams. Um, these exams uh, are not compulsory for students either. Exams are optional. But indeed, it would be a pity not to take advantage of them because this will increase their job opportunities. Um, ha having, passed, having taken the courses and having um, passed the exam um, makes, makes students more employable 
So obviously they will have more chances when they apply. And where they can take uh, the exams? They can take the exam in a classroom. If the university becomes a testing facility, um, they can also take it there. Um, they can take the exam in an accredited testing center, and we have testing centers everywhere uh, in many locations, um, or they can take exams from home. And, um, and we have two options for this. We have preliminary exams, which are um, kind of preparatory exams. So um, they will help students um, get used to the Red Hat certification exam. So they cover just the basic skills. They're also much cheaper. Uh, they're half price um, compared to the, um, to the Red Hat certification exams and they're just one hour. Um, they, they don't offer certification. They offer um, an ID after having taken the exam. However, they can students get a taste um, and they can get used to these exams because Red Hat certification exams are totally hands-on. Totally hands-on are not easy, I must be honest. And so I think preliminary exams are a great way to start. And now to help with this pandemic, in August we release remote exams. So Red Hat certification exams can now be taken from home. Of course, um, you need to, to meet some system requirements, um, but, but uh, they can be taken from home. So the same we had certification exam. I think this is the future now. <laughs> um, what kind of courses uh, we have uh, in our curriculum? So um, part of the program, we have um, eight courses. And based on the feature requests, we'll, be, um, we'll keep on adding more. We have um, three main courses covering Linux. System, Red Hat System Administration 1, 2, 3, and now in Revel 8, the, the third course focuses on automation. Um, in the cloud path, we have Red Hat OpenStack Administration and Containers course. I can honestly tell you that the Containers course is in a very high demand course now. Our customers are really looking for people with the container skills. Um, and covering the middleware path, we have Red Hat Application Development, Programming in Java and Microservices. And we also have certifications um, for most of them. Um, we also have some free technical overviews. They're free of charge. They can be found also on our website. <laughs> um, so regarding certifications, after passing, um, after having taken the courses, um, students and instructors have the chance now to take the exam. For the Linux path, um, they can take the exam to become Red Hat Certified System Administrator. And this can be taken after having passed the first two courses. And after passing the third course, then they can become the Red Hat Certified Engineer, which is obviously the best <laughs> in Linux uh, they can take. Um, we also have for each course in the middleware path um, um, two certifications. Um, and um, even though it was a preliminary exam, now the container one, so the exam covering the container skills is a Red Hat certification exam. Um, and we have two preliminary exams I've mentioned, so the ones uh, covering just the basic skills for the first course of Linux and for the OpenStack one. And yeah, as I said, we've, we've released the Red Hat remote certification yeah. exam option. Please. 30 yeah. seconds. Thank you. Oh, God. Okay, we have also different initiatives. Uh, we have an Adopt an Academy program, so we try to, to connect Red Hatters with universities. They can, um, uh, they can deliver a lecture, workshop to bridge this gap between what is being taught in the classroom and, and the real world. We also encourage students um, joining our student ambassador program. They can also promote our courses. They can help students organize different workshops, prepare for exams. Um, we support also instructors, let's say, um, if they want to um, to learn more about OpenShift um, with a real-time training um, inst um, instructor course, we pay uh, we pay this course. Um, and we also organize different types of events um, where we inform students about open source Red Hat, Red Hat Academy. We had one, La Universidad de Salamanca in Spain, which was a successful one, very interactive. There's a lot of questions and we also have workshops, demos um, done by our specialists. We also had a very successful one in Krakow. I I've seen someone, a participant there from Krakow. <laughs> that was also um, um, a great event, very interactive. There's um, They are a very active university. And after this kind of events, we saw that um, the level of uh, that students use more courses. And we also have events where we try to recruit. And um, I was also in, in München 
Uh, and we, I was supposed to be um, in, in team, well, Morocco this year, next year in Team Yushar, actually, Diana, <laughs> European conference. Uh, unfortunately, of course, due to pandemic, cannot uh, be there. Just to give you an idea how we are at a global level, we are approaching almost 2,000 Red Hat Academies, uh, and we are growing more and more. Um, and here are just some partners we have around the world. Um, and according to statistics, students uh, who took our courses um, stated they were better prepared, more independent, and they had also better opportunities. So there are only benefits with this program, um, and it's very easy to join the program. It's just an online registration. After that, we val um, after we validate it, we we'll give the access to the courses. The main requirement um, the program is that our courses stay free of charge. Um, to students, so it is forbidden to charge students for our Red Hat courses. Any tuition fees are perfectly okay, but as the profit is non, -pro as the program is non-profit, and we have the same uh, content in the commercial world, obviously we don't want to jeopardize the commercial world. So this is our main requirement. But there is a lot of flexibility, uh, free content, uh, free membership, discounted exams, nothing to lose. And we will be happy. We'll be happy to help more universities, more students um, join our uh, open source uh, family. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for this very lively presentation, Sandra, if I can say that. It's been really, really Thank great. And uh, you've seen uh, how many of uh, really um, interesting talks we had and so on. And I will kindly ask uh, uh, Robbie to go into gallery view so we can all see each other, all of us together. And um, it's going to be my big pleasure to try to have a short uh, debate. The main idea why we gather um, here so different ideas and tools and opinions coming from Australia to Europe, and in fact, Red Hat, we can even say United States, is because we really believe that we need to act together and very tightly together to build up the digital education to be open and the new normal to include as much as possible open education, the use of open educational resources, the reuse of anything, of technology, tools, resources and courses. Because the new normal is clear, it's going to be digital. Either if we go fully back face to face, I strongly believe that a lot of the resources and uh, learning environments and so on will stay here and will be loved and reused by everybody. But for this, we need a clear, very supportive system and also on long run. So not only focusing, OK, we are doing it now, but I don't care what's happening in two years, five years from now. In terms of education, we always think on long term. And uh, I'm so happy that also when, when Moodle initiated their initiative uh, 20 years ago, if I can say that, and also um, when uh, Open Education Technology uh, Festival and so on was initiated and with the new input, which is amazing from H5P and a lot of others, which we know also from uh, others open educational initiatives and with the Academy and hopefully with the support of European Union, at least in Europe, we will be moving towards a very inclusive and open uh, education system. So that's the whole idea why we gather everybody here. And now I have my first somehow question, which was also uh, asked to Schwein Tor, and he very kindly also uh, answered it uh, from the Q&A session. But I would like to ask also Martin about this. So the question was uh, also that, do we think that the new future, the new normal, might have a common standardized OR architecture and the relevant common ORs, which is once developed, can be evaluated, I'm adding this, reviewed, exactly as we do in research and in academia, and then taught and perused and used by at least a national level, if it is a na in a national language, like for example, Romanian, or at an international level. So Martin, do you see how ModelNet and H5P and other tools and probably even Big Blue Button or some other tools can be implemented on so how to say developing this? Well, uh, there's I have an interesting relation with standards. There is a lot of attempts at standards always, um, and 
the fact that we can talk now is the result of an amazing history of decades of standards in electricity, in electronics. Uh, you know, the internet is layers. We've got the OSI, we've got IEEE, we have I- IETF, we've got all these different bodies creating great standards. And, and just, you know, probably the, the biggest single thing in the internet was HTTP. Um, that just brought together a lot of thinking into something so simple that we all take it for granted now that you can get a piece of information around the world in, into your phone in a second. And um, there are these low-level standards like that that make a lot of sense. And then in education, however, there are all these standards bodies trying to build usually very complicated, heavy standards. We're talking SCORM 2004 and um, you know, IMS Global. Uh, I've sat with those workshops of people try, you know, 50 people all trying to add another 50 features onto something that already had 300 features and crazy. So, you know, we need to keep things simple. And what H5P are doing, for example, there is, is something that is simple enough to work. You know, it's like these things work. And, and things like LTI, that's a good standard. That's a learning tools interoperability that allows people to have a, some code over here that, that sends grades back to something over here. And we need to identify these good standards. And that's something I was hoping Open EdTech would do, that, that people who are interested in Open EdTech, that we wouldn't create standards, but we would at least say, well, that's a good one. Let's all, so, let's all support that. And that's a good one. Let's all support that. Um, it, as tempting as it is for somebody to sit down and build the whole castle on one piece of paper, it's impossible. It needs to be more organic and, and bottom up. Uh, that's the only things that really work that I've seen. I've seen too many castles fall down. Um, but Indeed, yes, um, standards are an important piece. And then software and, fits in. Standards. And the big question is, do you play a Moodle net with all of these tools somehow implemented or within? Or It will be lovely, for example, directly from Moodle, from a Moodle environment of uh, university or high school to export files directly to Moodle net and using the H5P OI hub, which is really lovely because it's inside the, the tool. Yeah, well, the, the H5P <laughs> hub and MoodleNet overlap in functionality quite a lot. So, you know, we'll, we'll work out ways to make them interoperate. But um, our MoodleNet is built into Moodle in such a way that people can share content between Moodle sites uh, or anyone can. Uh, and it, w- it would support a lot of different formats, not um, not only content-based things, but Moodle-based things, for example, which our, our backup format has become a sort of de facto standard. You know, you can export a forum and and create and then bring the forum into someone else's site or a, a, an assignment or a quiz or all these different pieces. Um, so we we do need to. Kind of identify what makes sense and 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 uh, and work towards together. We we need to work together. That's the key. That's thing. that's that's the key point, which I will also say. Working together, that's the main idea. And for this working together, uh, because this is open source and this is open education for free for everyone to use. Like also, Vintor mentioned it, and Martin is doing it all the time with with Moodle and all the plugins which are available to all will need funding. And probably this is where the European Union might come in. Uh, I know it's a big question for you, Miguel, so you don't need to exactly answer to it. But do you envision like uh, future funding projects or something like that for open source software, especially in education, but not necessarily also in government and in transportation and so on, where is much needed? Yeah, yeah, indeed. No, no, it's indeed it, it's a bit too soon for me to talk about this. But as I said, one of the things uh, we believe is we need to do is to help those that are behind those solutions that are really doing so much good. And any area you mentioned could be any. In this case, it's education, but it could be other areas. You have I should have put an image where you see uh, a complex puzzle and you see a small piece which is done by someone in Nebraska, and and. Uh, we need to help those people, and 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 yes, that's why we are doing this. Uh, f- we are going to do this uh, study on a potential funding mechanism that we could use to to finance those those teams and and to give the momentum. Because if something is clear for me, is that it's it's a very important period now. It's 
Of course, it's very um, tough what we are going through, but I think in terms of online education is exactly what we needed in terms of uh, momentum and digital transformation. So yeah, definitely we will explore that, but for me, it's too soon still to, to give a, an answer of that, but it's in our, of, of course, objective to envisage a funding mechanism that could help in education and other areas as well. Yeah, and maybe beside even Moodle, we will see in the Interoperability Academy or even in Red Hat Academy, the H5P tools and so on. I know Red Hat is using their own platform, but maybe they will join the club and having a more interoperable, really, uh, platform and system. And I quite, uh, quite like this idea of being interoperable and being able to use, and I quite love that Martin mentioned the HTML and uh, as a standard and everything which was done, imagine how rich Sir Tim Berners-Lee would have been if, uh, if he wouldn't have been an, releasing an open source software like and like all of the others which are here, how rich they could have been if they haven't really put out uh, their pieces of tremendous uh, work and also intelligence and innovation to everyone. So Sandra, what is Red Hat going through to be more open to interoperability? I know this is Red Hat and Linux is the basic on what we built up, but more than that. Yeah, I mean, Any questions. I know I'm never <laughs> easy. I'm never easy. I, we we are going through digital transformation. This is clear. And now with this pandemic, uh, it it is obviously more and more difficult. And uh, it's important also to offer to help students get the skills, get the online courses, to, um, uh, and get the the skills required in the job market. Um, for this reason, we've created this program. So um, it's about if, you, if you're talking about educational institutions, this program is perfectly there. Um, and as I said, Red Hat is definitely the open source leader. Uh, so we're talking about open source, we're talking about this shift no, to, to online courses. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, so maybe, maybe I have a simple question for you, mm -hmm. in, uh, Sandra. Uh, do you see the outcome of all the students which you trained over the last years? Like they go to entrepreneurial mode and then they built up from that open source software and another piece of open source software and they innovate based on that. Do you have any of that information? Or this is a very good question. <laughs> Actually, this is exactly what we are trying to do. This pro uh, this program uh, has been in place for around three and a half, four years. So uh, it's, fr it's fresh. It's like we are the new kids of the block, <laughs> um, to say so. But exactly this is the, the plan, to help students get the skills required in the job market and then go to companies, also um, um, promote Red Hat and help companies also um, move to open source and use our technologies. And for this reason, we are also creating now a we're working on a new platform to better connect the students to our uh, ecosystem. Um, we uh, we have students indeed who um, who are uh, who got internships and jobs uh, thanks to our courses. Uh, the, they got the skills, and they this is the feedback I received from universities and also students who got jobs also at Red Hat. They went through an internship or a graded program here, and now they they have a full time job as a consultant um, and so on. And and indeed, we need these people with the skills. We have more projects and hands to work on uh, to work on. <laughs> and this is the future. So this is a long term project. Indeed, we don't see now the results immediately, but I think for the future, it's essential. Uh, it's a priority for one. Yeah, very good. And that's the good point because, yes, uh, I think training our future, uh, especially in terms of students and so on, is something which we need to focus on and especially on encouraging them and be to believe in the, the power of open source and open education. Martin. And according to to that, uh, just to mention, uh, eighty percent, eighty five percent of hiring managers are looking for people with the open source skills. Um, <laughs> and and seeing also the stats around also the Linux jobs, but we're not just about Linux. Obviously, is the leader in Linux. Uh, I've seen also that seventy eight percent of hiring managers uh, looking for people with red uh, with Linux skills were looking for Red Hat Red Hat certified uh, people. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I, I <laughs> I often point to Red Hat as an example of where EdTech should also go because uh, uh, Linux runs the world. You know, all of those multi-billion dollar tech companies all run and depend on Linux and Red Hat is the biggest 
example of of something making Linux sustainable, driving the development. And I I, I met the CEO once in New York, and we had a, and and he was showing off all the the complexity of Red Hat, the amount of projects that are in that company, and the amount of different approaches to making sustainability and encouraging open source. It's incredible. Like it's really an amazing example to the world uh, so i'm so pleased you you're you, you're getting into the academy too because like like us you know so i may need to talk to you about the academy side of thing because i think the education around that is a very critical piece yeah and and i've seen that also Reintor has put up uh, the idea of having feedback because that's something uh, i also want to discuss something more about the training and i will involve everyone but i'm picking up on Reintor now because he mentioned feedback. I know Moodle has a very strong feedback system on evaluation, also in plugins and so on. And that's something which, uh, how you envision that, uh, to also for the HIP content, because until now it wasn't really possible to do that, not even inside the whole university. That's a feature which I was missing, to be able to give feedback on different tools which are in my system, in my university system. So any feedback on that is right talk please yeah yeah I, I shared in the chat a link to our upcoming feedback tool uh, aside from that I think in uh, it's a little bit up to the publishing system it's a, something that isn't part of the content so if you're making a course presentation and you're using Drupal you could use the feedback tool and uh, and attach it to it or there are many Drupal modules you could use to have uh, uh, to ask people to give feedback. We are currently building on hvp.com a tool called Confusion Indicator. So each teacher may decide to turn on this Confusion Indicator and then students may uh, give feedback and the tool will tell the teacher uh, which slide was the student on when he got confused and, and the student can type in what is it that made them confused. So yeah, I, I, uh, I've been building a lot of content myself. Uh, and no matter how much experience you have, it's always hard to guess perfectly what is intuitive and not. So it's super important to have tools to for students to give feedback. We've always built it in, in or not always, but in two of the three tools I've been building, there have been feedback tools eventually. And we've also been doing a lot of interviews of students when they're using the content to figure out, are they learning? Where are they dropping off, et cetera. So, so feedback is, is super important. Yes, it is. Thank you so much. And and uh, Sandra, do you have some comments on terms of how you can give feedback back to from inside the, for example, inside the Red Hat Academy or not publicly mainly? Publicly, well, um, on the platform, instructors and students uh, can also give feedback um towards us and in this way we we also we, we can add new features and and we can and we can grow so feedback is definitely very important and thanks to feedback feedback um we received we have developed a new platform and we have also added new courses so we always consider their feedback um so yes feedback is definitely important uh, so my 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 next question is as we were discussing about uh, academy and training and Martin has mentioned uh, the the Moodle Academy which they are building but that's mainly an event-based uh, learning uh, thing like Eden was doing Eden is running in every Monday since April a webinar on uh, topics which were initially related on supporting each other now we call it the new normal webinars then we have this uh, European Open Distance Learning Week, which goes also on Monday, because on Monday starts in Europe, the European Vocational uh, Training Week, where are a lot of other events. So maybe all of these initiatives are trying to give training and support will be brought somehow jointly together under that big umbrella, which the European Union with the Digital Education Action Plan tries to build like uh, part of the digital certification and the learning framework for the digital education action plan. Do you foresee, Miguel, or anybody, any one of you, how let's envision a, an ideal future where we will be able to share knowledge and information much more openly between us? Like it's happening somehow also into the freemium uh, web or the 
commercial web, but to make it much more powerful for the education system. Oh. Silence. Yes, please. <laughs> oh, no, I mean, it's <clears throat> uh, for us, it's clear. Right? It's open standards, open source. And <clears throat> Indeed, as, as we mentioned before, uh, we are still lacking that this global standard for everything and how to get there. Um, yeah, for me, it's not easy to say I, I, uh, I recently joined. Uh, so, uh, um, yeah, it will not be uh, a, an, an easy way. But I think, uh, as Martin mentioned before, it's about trying and seeing which is the best product rather than having someone trying to think everything from the beginning. And uh, that's why I think that this momentum that we have now, uh, that is forcing us to try new solutions, new, new ways of doing things, is what maybe will lead us there to, to that stage of finding a, a cross um, overarching solution for, for any educational platform. Martin, your take? Well, I, I think you're also hitting uh, with the, on the issue of sustainability and um, Definitely. You know, no, no, nobody wants to pay for software and stuff, but everyone wants to get paid. <laughs> everyone. And it, money and economies is what makes the world turn around. So we, we need to always sort of think how, how can we support the good things and, and, and minimize costs, of course, and, you know, and share and, you know, OER and open source are really great ways of sharing like I, I, I think someone did a calculation of how much Moodle would take to build from scratch, and it's like you know a hundred million dollars US or something. Um, it won't and be probably no. Yeah, you know, once you start adding all the rest, it's a lot. But uh, you just download it and get it for free. And same with Linux, you know, it's probably it's definitely billions of dollars of development. Um, that's all people that need to, need to be paid, that need to live and have families. Um, so we need to find new ways of shifting our economy around um, and supporting sustainability and initiatives for things that we like. And that may include small subscriptions or certifications or um, using this provider over that provider or things like that. But um, it's, it's kind of a mindset. You know, if we, I would love teachers to be saying to their schools, why aren't you using open source? You know, um, and kind of pushing it that way, um, and that's a mindset change we have to get to. It wasn't going to happen under under someone like Trump around, um, but uh, I, I think I think Europe in the world, Europe is the place where this is happening the most. And for me, Europe is the is kind of the hope of this mindset that we that we we have to get to. Yes, I definitely think that because of the power of European Union and uh, the openness of the European Union, which was encouraged that from the freedom of movement to freedom of everything in Europe, we need to think also of the freedom, real freedom of education, not only on paper, but on actions. Vintor, your thoughts on this, which also involves sustainability. I didn't dare to ask you how you're going to sustain the huge amount of data and space which is going to take uh, uploading all of those beautiful crafted videos and presentation into the OR uh, H5P hub? You know, ideally, I've, I've been thinking a lot about it. Uh, initially, when we started out, we were fairly naive. You know, we launched a supporter program and we thought the open source users would be happy to support us. Uh, the, they, they were not that much. They're using it for free. So then I thought, um, let's tax them. That would be the ideal solution. Of course, we can't do that, but that would be ideal. So the rich users of H4P or of Moodle, they'd be paying a lot more than than uh, what, what the poor countries are using it. So if, if if me and Martin are delivering software to someone in uh, in a very poor country, they get to use it for free. Uh, if uh, Ivy League college uses uh, H4P, they should be should be paying as much as they would do for a pro pro proprietary. Uh, system. So uh, that would be the ideal world. Uh, unfortunately, I can't tax people. So then you have to come up with these premium things that you're adding here and there. Uh, for the hub, uh, we are planning to add also paid content. So a publisher can sell paid content there. It's the same that uh, mobile phones are doing in their app stores, where uh, it, it allows them to share things for free. 
because they're also paid content. Uh, so, so, so that's how we plan to do it. And then people can filter on if they want the paid content or not. And if people buy paid content, there will be a cut that uh, goes to, to making it sustainable. So that's, that a good, that's a good idea. That's a good idea and a good business model, which quite a lot have been moving towards. In fact, is the idea of uh, the partners of Moodle, uh, which was uh, used, and also what Linux is using with their partners project and so on. So it's a mixture which is really encouraging. As we are going uh, a little bit even over the time, and I would like to close. And I know it's very late. It's very. It's getting close to midnight in and Perth, Australia, from where. Martin is coming. Luckily, in Europe, is only a nice afternoon, at least here in Timisoara in Romania. All the time when I'm running webinars, I want from everybody to think optimistically for the future and to come up with the one single word which describes their experience now or very recently and what they wish for the future. And I'll start uh, with Martin first. Survival. <laughs> Good point. It's, it's that serious. It's that serious. Seriously, we, we have a big issue with this planet that we have to get onto. We, we only have, you know, not long. So. One. Yeah, one single place to live on. One single life. Survival then. Sandra. Flexibility. We need to adapt to changes and be open. <laughs> As all the ladies, never one single word. So I will pick flexibility from you. Weintor, <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's hard to beat survival, but uh, and there are lots of big issues in the world, but I I try to not have any opinions about them. So so uh, for H for P, of course, it will be to to get to a place where we see the default being reused instead of uh, people creating from scratch so that we can have a lot better content in in a couple of years. That's that's what we are hoping for. Okay, so to reuse, Miguel? Well, I think an important word, at least I like, is consciousness, um, to be aware of what is going on because that will place us to, to point point to the right solutions, which I think for our case is sovereignty. Uh, independence. Okay. <laughs> Gosh, we are really having a, a tough, uh, tough section here. So I really thank you so much. My word, uh, I will somehow I was thinking between open and online together and togetherness, but I will stick with togetherness because I strongly believe that uh, if we stick all of us together and we believe in the power of us all being open and flexible and survived and being able to reuse and and uh, then we really be able to build up a proper and and inclusive uh, education in the future where digital will be used uh, for its best value and for its uh, how to say added value which it really can bring into the people's life thank you so much for coming here martin Schweintor, sandra and miguel I really loved, again, seeing all of you, in, not in person, but at live live. And uh, the recording is going to be available on Eden website and on Eden YouTube channel. And I kindly invite you to the next session, which starts in less than half an hour from now, which is the opening session to the uh, Open Classroom Conference, uh, which is co-organized by Eden. And then on Monday, at the last webinar on uh, the idea of uh, vocational training and how open education and online education can support vocational training, which is the last webinar on the Eden European Open Distance Learning Week. But before the year ends, we will still be back with more interesting webinars. So stay close, stay close everyone and try to be open and healthy and so let's survive and let's meet somewhere next year in person. Thank you so much. Goodbye from Timisoara, Romania. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Yeah.